story happened to my grandfather when he was young. One night, he was carrying bundles of firewood into the storeroom before the rain came when suddenly from outside the gate came a very violent knock on the door. It was late at night. At this time, someone must have come to an urgent matter. Thinking about it, Grandpa quickly put down the pile of firewood in his hand, grabbed the oil lamp and went to open the gate. It turned out that it was Uncle Fang, the village head, and my grandfather was also a little surprised because he did not understand why the village head was still looking for him at this time. Grandpa wondered what was wrong, but Uncle Fang didn't answer, just stared at my grandfather. Uncle Fang then said nothing and went straight into the house. My grandfather also noticed something strange about Uncle Fang, so he still tried to ask Uncle Fang but in return there was silence. The atmosphere at this time was becoming more and more strange and confusing. My grandfather looked at Uncle Fang's back, suddenly realized that his gait today was very strange like a puppet being controlled, looking a bit scary. At this time, my grandfather felt that Uncle Fang was no longer normal. He also suspected something, but still tried not to think too much. Before my grandpa could close the gate, he rushed to Uncle Fang and put his hand on his shoulder to ask what happened. At this time, being held back, Uncle Fang slowly turned around still refusing to say a word. When he turned his face completely, my grandfather quickly raised the oil lamp to see Uncle Fang's face clearly. As expected, even Uncle Fang's face had become strange and confusing. At first glance, he knew that Uncle Fang had encountered something with bad luck. My grandfather shook Uncle Fang's body to wake him up. After shaking for a while, Uncle Fang's face also returned to normal. Suddenly he fell to the ground unconscious. My grandfather was also very surprised and quickly called them to wake up. At that moment, for a moment, my grandfather saw a figure standing outside the gate. It was a little figure, like a child. It stood at the door, staring inside, its face very lifeless, scary. But as soon as my grandfather turned around to get a better look, the child ran away very quickly. Because Uncle Fang was fainting, my grandfather didn't give chase, but it was the shadow of a child. My grandpa wondered that all the children in the village had gone to sleep. So who was that child just now? Not thinking much, worrying about the village head was more important, so Grandpa put those thoughts aside and looked at Uncle Fang's situation, who was now unconscious on the ground. Uncle Fang's mouth was foaming, and it looked very heavy. Grandpa hastily used folk remedies to wake Uncle Fang up. After a long time using many other tools, Uncle Fang was also regaining consciousness. Uncle Fang wasn't fully awake yet, but he kept saying that he had seen a ghost. Then his eyes widened, his body trembled as if he was very scared, and his mouth kept saying that there were ghosts and that his son was dead. Hearing this, my grandfather was also surprised and asked the village head to explain everything that had happened. Although he was still tired, Uncle Fang still began to tell everything. Uncle Fang was a village head who recently moved to the village. The rainy season was also coming if it rained too much. It would cause floods, making people in the village extremely miserable. So Uncle Fang gathered the strong men in the village to strengthen the dam. But when everyone was working and digging up the soil to add more to the dam, suddenly they saw something scary sticking out of the ground. Hey. It was a coffin. Seeing this, everyone hurriedly informed the village head. Uncle Fang also told everyone to stop working and asked if anyone knew who this coffin belonged to. After questioning the village for a while, two men finally came and examined the matter of the coffin. 
They prevented Uncle Fang from continuing to build the dike, but instead dig the coffin up and bury it properly before continuing. But the village head disagreed because no one knew about this coffin and the dam construction was extremely urgent. Although a bit annoyed and disagreed, listening to the village head's persuasion that it was for the sake of the whole village, the two brothers reluctantly obeyed his uncle's words without making offerings or anything else. After that, the work on the dike also continued. Everyone started to fill the coffin with soil and continued to prepare for the dike. Because the flood season was coming, everyone was busy with work and forgot about the coffin. But, unexpectedly, that night was also Uncle Fang's fateful day. That night, his eldest daughter took an oil lamp and said she would go to her uncle's house nearby. But after waiting for a long time, it was already late and Uncle Fang still hadn't seen his daughter come back. He started to feel insecure. After that, Uncle Fang decided to look for his daughter. On the way, he suddenly saw a familiar figure from afar right at the corner of the wall, holding the oil lamp that his daughter had brought with her earlier. Feeling puzzled, Uncle Fang called out but saw no response from his daughter, so he went over there and examined the situation. It was dark, so the air inside the corner of the wall became even hazier. The light from the oil lamp made everything very magical. The daughter stood leaning against a wall. Her head was down and unresponsive when Uncle Fang called. As Uncle Fang brought the lamp closer to his daughter's face, the horrors became clear. A rope out of nowhere was hooking her daughter's neck as if she had intentionally hanged herself. This thing made Uncle Fang extremely panicked. He couldn't believe his eyes. He called out his daughter's name but to no avail. His legs trembled and he could no longer stand. The scary scene was clear now. The rope was tied through the branch above. It was like a noose and took the life of his daughter. Her face had become white, blood veins emerged crimson in both eyes, and a long striped tongue looked extremely scary. Uncle Fang still tried to bring his hand to her nose to check again. He couldn't believe his daughter was dead. Ah! Uncle Fang panicked, turned around and ran away as fast as he could. He planned to run to his brother's house nearby to find help, and since his younger brother also had some understanding of spiritual matters, he thought his brother might be able to help because his daughter's death was so strange. He was in a hurry to run when suddenly he was distracted by a noise coming from behind. It was the sound of footsteps. It echoed through the empty street getting louder and louder like someone was running behind him. Uncle Fang slowly stopped and listened more carefully. He came to a complete stop now. Something enchanting made him slowly turn around. Uncle Fang glimpsed the figure slowly approaching him from the darkness of the road. A stream of cold air ran down his spine causing Uncle Fang to panic. He shouted to ask what the person behind him was, which also helped him to be less afraid. After that, the shadow of the other person also gradually approached him. Under the dim moonlight, the shadow's face was also more visible. But the other face was very strange. The eyes were wide and bloodshot, its face was pale and the mouth was smiling, a ghostly smile. Uncle Fang was too scared to scream for help because he also sensed that what was standing in front of him was not a human. But for some reason his eyes got tired right after that and then slowly fell asleep without knowing when. After that he couldn't remember anything until he woke up and met my grandfather. He told my grandfather everything and also described it as a small childlike figure. My grandfather also heard about the kid who drowned in the lake. 
For some reason the family buried it next to the reservoir. Because of some floods, the tombstone was also lost. The kid's family also moved to another place, so no one remembers this anymore. Then, my grandfather and Uncle Fang went to the place where the daughter had been hanged to check. When they got there, they took the girl's body down. She was dead. Uncle Fang was extremely sad. The following day, Uncle Fang called everyone to come and dig up the child's coffin to move it to another place. He also invited the shaman to come and pay respects to him. Uncle Fang was extremely painful because the departure of his daughter was also because of his haste. That thing made him regret it for a long time later. Until now, this story has spread widely in my village. It was summer and the weather was burning hot. To get some fresh air, some men huddled together and sat in front of the alley. At night, mosquitoes became more active. They were everywhere and bit them, so they became irritated and scowled. When everyone noticed that the sky was getting darker, they all decided to go home early. The old men banded together and they didn't forget to tell Uncle Pew to hurry back home because they heard rumors of ghosts appearing in this area recently. Uncle Pew could only laugh after hearing them grumble and heading home one by one. Because he didn't intend to go home at this time anyways, so he hummed to let everyone go first. Talk about Uncle Pew. He came to this village many years ago to live with his family and work as a teacher. But he was unlucky because his wife died young, leaving only him and his children. They grew up and moved to the city to pursue their careers, leaving him alone in this village. Coming home in this hot weather was very uncomfortable for such a lonely person so it was better to sit outside and enjoy the air thinking and then Uncle Pew kept smoking. Because it was full moon day, the moon was especially big and bright, accompanied by the quiet atmosphere of the poor countryside which really made people feel more lonely and cold. Uncle Pew was still sitting there unsure what to think. The cigarette butts were all over his feet and he had no idea how long he had been sitting there. But Uncle Pew didn't care. He continued to smoke and think about life without returning home. And as a result, he witnessed something horrifying. Uncle Pew took out the last cigarette from the box, thinking that when he finished it, he would return home. So he slowly took it out, then lighted it up, took a long breath. The light from the lighter was most likely the only glimmer at this point. The sound of footsteps from afar suddenly sounded in that quiet space, catching Uncle Pew's attention. Because it was too late at this time, there was no one left to walk down the street. The entire street was most likely just him who hadn't returned home. Uncle Pew looked up, curious to see who it was. The silhouettes of two people slowly approached from the darkness, looking at the tall figures that were most probably men. Even though he couldn't see them clearly but still could figure that they looked very unusual. The two men did not walk up to Uncle Pew, but rather around a nearby stone mill. Uncle Pew had no idea what they were up to or what they were saying. Only glimpses of their figures could be seen. They just kept going around the mill. Uncle Pew slowly stood up and approached them, asking what they were doing and if he could help them in any way as a diversion because he didn't want to go home alone anyway. 
Uncle Pew approached and inquired, but received no response from the other two, who were still walking around the mill, unsure what to do. It appeared to be two tall figures, but why were they always lowering their heads like that? Perhaps they were looking for something on the ground, so Uncle Pew directly stated that he had a flashlight, which could assist them in finding it more easily. At this point, they began to respond to Uncle Pew, but their voices were shaky and made the hairs on their back of the listener's neck shiver as if they were speaking from the underworld rather than living people. But that wasn't what bothered Uncle Pew. It was the fact that they claimed to be looking for their heads. Uncle Pew was stunned and motionless as a result of the response. Then, in the dim moonlight, Uncle Pew noticed an anomaly from the other two, who were clearly speaking to him, but he couldn't see their heads. It was impossible to talk while bowing at the same time. When Uncle Pew noticed that things were getting stranger, he decided to turn on his flashlight and shine it on them to see who they were because there was no one in this village he didn't know. He asked their names, shining at them at the same time. Uncle Pew directly shone on their faces as the light began to shine from below. They still did not respond. As the flashlight slowly shone on the body, a terrible thing appeared in front of Uncle Pew's eyes, making him panic. Not that they had their heads down, but they had no heads at all. Uncle Pew's heart was pounding and sweating as he realized he had met devils and that everything in front of him was too frightening. At the same time, the other two demons kept asking Uncle Pew if he had seen their heads. They searched for a long time but couldn't find them. Their shapes were gradually becoming stranger and stranger. That increased his panic and fear and Uncle Pew fell backwards, but his legs were frozen without realizing it, causing him to fall backwards and drop the cigarettes in his mouth. The surrounding space seemed to come to a halt. It gradually darkened and the other two demons moved towards Uncle Pew. Nothing but the voices of the other two demons could be heard at this time. They got closer. The sound became more piercing. Uncle Pew looked at them in terror. Even more terrifying, their silhouettes became increasingly distorted, making them appear monstrous. Suddenly, he felt his head spinning and the pain was so intense that it appeared as if someone was hitting it with a hammer. <sighs> Uncle Pew began to feel suffocated, which was accompanied by an unfathomable stench that hit his nose. Then the surrounding atmosphere went black and Uncle Pew passed out. Hallucinations began to appear in his mind. The stone mole kept appearing in his mind. Next, a clear scene began to appear more clearly and Uncle Pew saw many people standing around the stone mill. They dressed like the old style Japanese army and they still had guns and swords in their hands. They looked threatening. Then, there was an image of two men with their hands tied and kneeling on the ground, while the other soldiers waved their swords ready to cut off their heads. A man with a violent appearance who appeared to be the commander raised his hand to issue orders to those soldiers. The sharp sword was raised to its full height and slashed down hard. Blood splattered everywhere, even on the soldiers' faces, but on their lips were merciless smiles. The sharp sword severed the two heads which fell to the ground and stared at Uncle Pew. The two heads were lying on the ground and their bodies were hung in front of the village gate by the soldiers. The villagers were so terrified that they didn't dare to bring the two heads to bury. Seeing these things made Uncle Pew panic and startled awake, everything was so real that Uncle Pew felt as if he had just witnessed the execution at that time. But as soon as he opened his eyes, he realized he was still in the village and the two headless young men from earlier were also approaching him.
He screamed and fainted again in terror. Not sure how long he had been lying there, but he faintly heard a voice calling him in his ear but didn't dare to open his eyes. Despite the villagers attempt to wake him up and ask him why he was lying here, Uncle Pew refused to open his eyes. It was only until he had calmed down a little and the sunlight was shining in his eyes that he dared to slowly open his eyes and see two people from the village looking at him with suspicion. Uncle Pew stood up. He heard that when people started to go to work early in the morning, they saw him lying on the ground and came to wake him up. Many people gathered because they thought Uncle Pew had seen a ghost last night. Uncle Pew had no idea he'd been lying out there all night, nor did he know when he fainted. He began to tell everyone everything. Uncle Pew also described their appearance and costumes and confirmed that the two ghosts were looking for their heads in this area. When an old man who had lived in the village for a long time heard that and recalled the past, there were two young men from the village that were executed at this very mill. But their heads were stolen by wild animals and their bodies were buried by the villagers. People could observe two headless strangers prowling around on the full moon nights after that time. They always asked where their heads were each time they met any villagers. The voices would sound as if it had came straight from hell. It was a strange story that happened that made my whole village stir and bewildered for a long time. The story happened on a day in late summer, early autumn, when my whole village sank into the inherent peace. There was a family that encountered a bad thing. At that time, the wife was busy preparing food in the kitchen. Suddenly, realizing that the vegetables were running out, then she asked her husband to go down to the warehouse to pick more vegetables. The husband listened to his wife's words, leisurely entered the house, smoked a cigarette and walked towards the warehouse. Since then, his family had lived by farming, so the house always built a warehouse to store harvested vegetables. Usually the family's food reserves were kept in a secret cellar that only family members knew. This thing was a habit that had been passed down through generations in the house. As usual, the husband went straight to the mouth of the tunnel, slowly crouched down. He opened the lid, looked inside and briefly checked it because it was a place to store food, but few people frequented it, so there were often rats and a few reptiles living there. After feeling safe, the husband followed the vertical ladder placed close to the foundation and went down to the basement. The whole basement without light became extremely dark, but it made few strange noises that made the husband curious and look around. As soon as he arrived, he immediately panicked because he saw a flock of colorful poisonous snakes wiggling on the ground, eyes wide open looking at him. The husband had never seen the strange snake before, so he panicked and shouted and clung to the ladder, looking for a way up. The snake saw the husband run away and immediately chased after him. They slithered in long rows close to his heels, causing him to panic, constantly calling his wife to help. The wife heard her husband's voice, immediately put aside the cooking, hurriedly ran to her husband to check it out. Looking at the panicked expression on her husband's face, the wife felt extremely worried and then asked him about what had happened. Even though the husband had reached a safe place, he was still afraid in his heart. He kept telling his wife that he encountered a herd of snakes under the basement, surprising her. The wife found it hard to understand because there had been no snake that could sneak into the family's basement since then. 
To be sure, she also actively went to the place to check. The husband immediately stepped back and pointed to the mouth of the basement, which had not yet been closed. He told his wife to calm down because the number of snakes below was many, possibly up to a dozen. The wife was very confident at first, but when she approached the mouth of the basement, she heard a noise below and began to feel uneasy in her heart. She cautiously looked down at the mouth of the basement to check if there were snakes like her husband said. Indeed, the scene unfolding before her eyes made her scream. With her own eyes, she had seen the small snakes squirming together in the dark basement, which she did not know before. Not only that, but these snakes are also very aggressive. The snakes saw the wife looking at them immediately jumped up, bared their venomous fangs to scare the wife into shock. The husband saw that and went to his wife, hugged her. Both of them thought together about how to deal with the crowd at snakes below. The husband was very reckless at first, pulled up his sleeves and then went straight to the basement, wanting to catch each snake by himself. The wife saw this and immediately went to stop her husband for fear that he was in danger. After that she pondered for a while and then asked her husband to alight a large torch to bring in. The husband listened to his wife, immediately went out and turned back with a big torch. When he reached the mouth of the basement, the husband threw the burning torch down from above, burning down dozens of snakes below. The light from the fire on the torch illuminated the entire basement, revealing the space inside. From the bottom rose a thick smoky grey smoke with an unpleasant odour. The higher the smoke rose, the more it would change into a thick grey black as big as large tornado, creeping through the door frames of the house, flying out and disappearing into the air. After the smoke cleared, the couple hugged each other and crept back to the basement to check the movement, but everything seemed to have become quieter. The husband slowly looked down. At this time, the husband breathed a sigh of relief and told his wife everything was fine. He did not see a snake anymore. After everything was resolved, the husband immediately told his wife to continue her work and he would go down to the basement to pick up food for his wife. The husband had just arrived at the place. The worry about the snakes earlier rose in him. The husband saw this, immediately looked for a wooden stick and then slowly went deep, his eyes constantly looking around. The sound of his footsteps echoed throughout the basement, creating an uncomfortably tense atmosphere. He carefully checked every nook and cranny of the basement so as not to miss a single snake. Suddenly, he was caught by a rustling sound. He walked to the source of the sound, raised a wooden stick, held it tightly and slowly walked over to check. As he approached, the husband saw a large white snake curled up in the corner of the room, hiding behind the family's food baskets. The husband saw the scene and panicked and shouted. Reflexively, he kept raising the wooden stick and slamming it down. In the first hit, the white snake was fortunate to dodge. But on the second hit, the wooden stick hit the white snake's head, causing red blood to splash. The snake then lay dead on the ground, surrounded by the blood that made the husband dumbfounded. He looked in horror at the snake's large body lying in front of him and quickly handled it, then turned back up. At this time he felt tired in his body, so he went to bed to rest. But in the evening the husband kept lying on the bed no matter how much his wife and children called. He refused to get up to eat. The husband stayed like that until the following morning, making his wife feel both strange and worried. The wife planned to go to the market to buy some things, but she felt insecure as soon as she got out of the house. She decided to return home immediately, running into the room to wake the husband up. After a while, when the husband did not answer, the wife jerked the blanket off to check. At this time, the wife panicked when she saw her husband lying motionless on the bed with his body curled up like a snake looking very scary. The wife saw the horror scene and screamed and quickly ran out. Suddenly she remembered her husband's story of killing snakes 
and thought of an idea. So, she went to invite the best magician in the village to come to help her heal her husband. She alone brought the magician into the house. As soon as the magician reached the courtyard, his heart suddenly appeared a sense of uneasiness. He followed the wife into the bedroom to check. The wife did not expect the situation to become so serious. Based on the celestial eye, the magician saw the spirit of the white snake wrapping around the husband's body, waiting for the day to eat the meat. The magician did not rush to conclusions, so he turned to ask the wife if there were snakes in the house recently. Hearing that, the wife also nodded to confirm. She told the story about the snakes in the basement yesterday to the magician. After listening, the magician sighed, saying that the family had accidentally killed the white snake, a dangerous snake. When the wife heard it, she panicked, cried and begged the magician to save the life of her husband and the whole family. The magician saw that the wife was also pitiful so he immediately thought of a way to help this poor family. After pondering for a while, the magician also told the wife that the white snake was very angry now. It was difficult to forgive her and her husband, but there was only one way that could help them. So the magician asked the wife to lead him down to the basement where the white snake and his children had lived to build an altar. The wife was busy helping the magician with a hand, preparing a large respectful altar to apologize to the white snake. The magician after preparing the altar also began to bless and worship and then left. Before leaving he still did not forget to instruct the wife every year on this day to celebrate the death anniversary of the white snake and regularly worship and beg for the white snake to forgive her sins. The husband soon regained consciousness, but his spirit was broken and weak. Listening to his wife tell everything, he was also very repentant, going to the white snake altar alone to apologize. Since then, the food storage basement in the house has become a place to worship the white snakes, and the altar is always full of incense and food. This was a rather scary story that Investigation Team X encountered. Captain Lee and Inspector Leo returned to the headquarters after a long business trip. Leo was feeling hungry now and was about to ask Captain Leo to eat. But suddenly, Captain Lee's cell phone rang. After hearing a few sentences, Captain Leo's expression suddenly changed. Hurry up! Another strange case! Captain Lee urged Leo to hurry up back to the interrogation room. It seemed that this was an extremely bizarre and creepy case that made Captain Lee care especially. The incident happened in an apartment building in the city. Here a group of people from the management wanted to enter a woman's house to check. They suspected the girl was doing something illegal. But the girl resolutely prevented them and said that they dared not to enter the house illegally. By this time, the police were also present. Okay, calm down and tell me what's wrong, the policeman intervened. The woman who managed the apartment building said that many people suspected that this girl was abusing children. This girl bought a house here about a year ago and lived alone. But what was confusing was that she bought a lot of food every day, like cooking for three to four people. Moreover, she lived a closed life and did not communicate with anyone. Since the declaration of information had not been completed, the manager had to come and urge her many times. But every time this girl didn't want to talk, so the manager kept knocking on the door in anger. 
It took a long time for her to open the door and look annoyed. Then the girl said that she would take a photocopy of the information and add it to the management later. After saying that, she slammed the door with a very cold attitude. Another strange thing was that that day a person was taking her grandson to play in the park when she saw this girl passing by. Suddenly, her four-year-old grandson burst into tears when he saw this woman. The older woman felt very strange, so she comforted the little grandchild and asked him why he was crying. But she didn't expect that the little grandchild would scare her so much that she was speechless. The child said that there were many ghosts of boys on the back of the other woman. They were hugging her, looking very scary. Although the older woman could not see anything, she thought that children's eyes were pure and could see dirty things. She thought that the child could not lie. So the people around the apartment gathered to see if there was anything shady inside this girl's house. The police almost laughed when they heard those myths and said, <laughs> You have a good intention, but you really shouldn't invade others' privacy, okay? The policeman then turned to the girl and asked this girl to show her identification. At this point, she was really a little worried. This made the police suddenly a little suspicious. When the police wanted to see her papers, the girl thought and hesitated for a moment. Finally, she went back into the house and took her ID card and showed it to them. But he found it very strange. It turned out that the date of birth on the ID card showed that the woman was born in 1974. But the police did not believe it because the woman looked 25 years old, not a woman in her 40s. He also began to wonder if this woman was scamming to use other people's identity information to carry out illegal activities. So he wanted to go into her house to check. The woman knew that she could not prevent the police from entering the house to investigate, but she still fiercely blocked the door and made sure no one was allowed in. This made him even more suspicious, so he pushed the woman aside. The policeman entered the house and began to check each room. The woman at this point was very nervous and started shaking. When the policeman opened the bedroom door, he was shocked by the scene inside. There was no bed or table in the room, only two skinny boys sitting on the floor looking very weak. Seeing the police approaching, the two boys froze for a long time before trying to call for help. Police! Policeman, help! Uh, we, uh, help save us, please! The policeman immediately called their headquarters and called an ambulance. Moments later, police and paramedics arrived. The woman was arrested by the police and taken to the station. The two boys were also taken into the hospital by medical staff for treatment. When questioned by the police, the woman only admitted that she had caused minor injuries to the boys, but she was silent when asked about how she did it. All the stories of the case were told by the boy who was being treated. The boy said that the woman was very scary. It was a terrible nightmare for two 12-year-old boys. The boy said the woman was a vampire. He said that he was an orphan in an orphanage. At the age of eight, he was adopted by this beautiful aunt. This made the boy very happy. The woman looked gentle. That night, she also made a big pot of chicken for the boy and said that it nourished his body. The boy said that the chicken had many red dates in it and it tasted a bit strange. But he still ate it very well because he had never eaten so well. Meanwhile, the other woman kept looking at the boy and smiling. Then the woman carried another pot of chicken into the bedroom, saying that there was another brother in the house. However, the boy never saw his brother. At that moment, the woman suddenly looked very scary. She gave a sinister smile. That night, the woman let the boy sleep with her. At that time, the boy felt a little strange. The boy who had never had parents suddenly lived in a beautiful house seeing the silhouette of a gentle mother from the woman. He felt very happy and lucky. After dinner, the boy felt sleepy and soon he fell asleep. He didn't know how long he slept. 
the boy suddenly felt a sharp pain in his arm. The pain woke him up. Suddenly the boy was startled by what happened before his eyes. The woman used a knife to make a small cut on the boy's arm and was sticking out her long tongue to suck his blood. The boy didn't know how much blood the woman sucked to make his head dizzy. Her appearance at that time looked very strange and extremely scary. The boy withdrew his arm, clutched the wound and shivered at her. The woman wiped the blood from the corner of her mouth and said, he was a blood slave. The woman then threw the boy into the room with the brother she had told him about earlier. It was then that the boy saw his older brother. He also was a boy about his age but he looked very thin. From then on, the woman took a cup filled with the blood of one of the two boys every day. The woman held an electric baton every day to threaten if the two children dared to resist. That woman barely ate any other foods, only drinking a cup of their blood a day. After that, the boy was saved and the woman was quickly arrested. This case was very strange. So she would be taken by Captain Lee next. After receiving the case, Captain Lee and Inspector Leo went to the interrogation room of the police station. On the way here, Captain Lee briefly reviewed the details of the case to facilitate the interrogation of the female vampire. After being arrested, this woman confessed to the crime, but did not disclose the motive for the crime. This made the police suspect that there were many other accomplices. In the interrogation room, the girl appeared taciturn, lowering her head with a blank expression. When meeting Captain Lee and Inspector Leo, the girl remained adamantly silent. I think you should frankly tell the truth, it will be good for you. Captain Lee began to interrogate her. She said that she pleaded guilty. In an addition to the other two children, she also killed three other children, but she still refused to disclose the process and motive of the crime. Captain Lee told her that the police had collected some important evidence. They investigated her records and learned that she worked as a PhD student for a wildlife institute after graduating in 1995. She had worked there for a year and then abruptly quit without explaining why and she completely disappeared after that. The problem lay in that research institute. Suddenly Captain Lee mentioned the name of Dr. John. Unexpectedly the woman was surprised to hear the name Dr. John. At the same time she used to be arrested for stealing blood bags from the hospital. Captain Lee confidently said that all of the information had been thoroughly investigated by the police and hoped she would cooperate. Hearing this, knowing that she couldn't hide it anymore, the woman began to tell everything. She started sobbing and said that she was Dr. John's student and not only did he become a vampire, but so did she. Previously her real name was Lena and she graduated with honors in pharmacy. Then she applied for a job at a foreign funded biotechnology company. This news made Lena very excited. Her salary when practicing here was also very high. And the person who guided her at the time was Dr. John, a knowledgeable and very talented person. However, the biological experiment project that Dr. John took her to see was extremely mysterious. He let her participate in this project only but she didn't think much of it. At this point, she followed Dr. John into the study every day. After working for several months, she was still not sure what this project was exactly. She was only assigned to record data while Dr. John drew blood from various animals every day. Gradually, she also felt the strangeness of this project because the blood research exceeded the normal pharmacology work. Once while Lena was reviewing the data, Dr. John suddenly walked into the lab and asked what she was doing. She thought that Dr. John would get angry, but on the contrary, he was happy to say that the experiment was successful and then asked for help. This time Dr. John took some blood samples from her and wanted to do a new experiment. Dr. John didn't explain her questions. He just said that his ultimate goal was to experiment with human blood samples. 
Okay, Lena, can you help me with this? He took out a pill from a small box and wanted Lena to take it. Please take the pill. Then let's see the results. He said that he wanted to see if the reaction of women's blood was different from that of men's when it reacted to drugs. Feeling that Lena was a little suspicious, Dr. John said that he would take this pill first. Do you know how long it will take for a set of clinical trials to enter human trials? He asked Lena. After he finished speaking, he immediately put the medicine in his mouth and swallowed it. After taking one pill, he handed the remaining pill in the small box to Lena. At that time, Lena had no way to refuse, so she reached out and took the pill. Under John's eager gaze, Lena had no choice but to use her body to test drugs like him. Lena hesitated. She did not know what would happen to herself if she took the spill into her stomach. Then Dr. John told her to keep an eye on her body for the next days to see if she had any strange symptoms and then let him know. Three days passed and Dr. John did not come to the research center. Lena was hanging around in the laboratory all day. But today he suddenly appeared out of nowhere, making Lena jump. Dr. John's eyes were sunken, his cheeks were thin, his appearance frightened Lena. He seemed a bit surprised when he knew that Lena's body did not react after taking the pill. He took some blood samples from her hand and examined them carefully. Seeing Dr. John's mental state at the time, Lena became a bit worried and felt that something was wrong with her. After observing for a long time, Dr. John suddenly banged the table very angrily. He didn't understand where he went wrong. After showing anger, suddenly Dr. John's body went into shock. His eyes widened suddenly and he seemed very uncomfortable in his body. He suddenly fell to his knees, vomiting a lot of blood. The scene was terrifying. The amount of blood he vomited was very large, which caused Lena to panic. She stood beside him for a long time without daring to move. After a while, Lena rushed over to help Dr. John up and said she would call an ambulance. But when he heard Lena about to call an ambulance, he immediately shouted at her. His reaction scared Lena because she had never seen Dr. John like this. Perhaps knowing that she was in a state of panic, Dr. John said he was fine. He told her by all means not to tell anyone. The next day when she entered the laboratory, Lena saw that the door was not locked. She thought that Dr. John had arrived early today. Suddenly, the scene in front of her startled her. Dr. John was holding a bag of blood and drinking it. He looked very thirsty. Hearing the sound, Dr. John quickly turned his head to look at her. His appearance was very scary. His mouth was covered with fresh blood. Dr. John was now staring at Lena with bloodshot eyes as if he had lost his eyes. <laughs> human blood. Only human blood works. It's human blood. <laughs> then he smiled strangely at her and said scary things. Not stopping there, he looked straight at Lena and said it would be like to test fresh human blood. So immediately he charged towards her with great ferocity. Lena then screamed and turned to run out. She was terribly scared. Then Lena's scream seemed to have brought Dr. John back to his senses. He stopped chasing her. However, Dr. John's condition was still terrifying. A pair of bloodshot eyes fixed on Lena. Suddenly he said that the experiment was successful. However, he couldn't control it. He told Lena to be careful. It's a new step. Vampires will be back, he said as he turned away. Even more frightening was that Lena also accidentally took that drug. Lena's whole body was shaking. She was confused if she would become like Dr. John. That was also the last time Lena saw Dr. John. But within a few days, many strange cases happened. The dead person was a young woman in a red shirt, believed to have been sucked to death. Since that case, tragedies like this have happened one after another. The victims were all girls in red.
It was said that the killer targeted women who often went alone and that murderer did not steal anything but only sucked human blood. After a few female corpses were drained of blood, the entire city was engulfed in an atmosphere of terror. It was rumored that vampires had appeared. It was said that they had seen vampires in a park near the outskirts of the city. An older man doing morning exercises saw a man holding a live rooster on the grass. His mouth was full of blood and he looked horrible. It was Dr. John. He had completely lost his mind and became a real vampire. Since then, no one had seen him again. But the legend of modern vampires had spread across the country. The research institute immediately shut down the case about Dr. John. After that, Lena also quit. Then Lena returned to her hometown to rest for a while, but did not expect the other pill to work for her. So when did you start sucking blood? Captain Lee looked at her with a serious expression. She said that was when she started researching Countess Dracula as she was also affected by the drug. Countess Dracula was a powerful woman like Elizabeth Bathory. There were the demons that had sucked human blood since ancient times and used human blood to hold on to the beauty of youth. Captain Lee continued to ask Lena about her process of killing people to suck blood. And when it came to the blood sucking process, Lena's tears welled up. She started to remember what happened. When she returned to her hometown, she stayed at home for a year. But during this time, her body also began to change. She became very bloodthirsty. Every time she saw blood, her heart burned. She desperately wanted to drink those drops of fresh blood. The bright red blood that looked so beautiful was like the most delicious delicacy in the world at this moment, tempting her. That intense bloodlust tormented her nerves every day, making her struggle a lot to suppress her thirst. It seemed that only the sensation of sucking blood into her mouth could make her feel alive. Unknowingly, she realized that she had become a vampire. Lena woke up with a start to find it was a terrible dream, a dream of being sucked into blood. That horrible dream appeared every night. Lena knew that the drug eventually had a side effect on her body, and she would also become a terrifying evil like Dr. John. That day, Lena tiredly went downstairs to eat with her mother. The strange thing was that since her body had a craving for blood, the food her mother usually cooked was like something difficult to swallow when she put it into her mouth. Every time she ate these normal meals, she felt very nauseous, had difficulty swallowing, and was always in a state of weakness. Finally, one day she couldn't take it anymore. As soon as the food entered her mouth, she felt very disgusted, so she rushed to the toilet. Lena vomited out all the food in her stomach. At that time, her mother thought that Lena might be pregnant, but thinking about it again, she couldn't be because her daughter had been in the house all the time. Lena couldn't tell her family about it, but she couldn't eat food. She knew that she could only rely on herself and could not depend on anyone else. She did her research about her condition. Unexpectedly in history, there was such a person called Elizabeth Bathory, a countess of Hungary in medieval Europe. She was called the Vampire and was an extremely scary character. At this point, Lena realized that Dr. John's so-called EB project was the English abbreviation of Countess Dracula, and the project was a secret study of human blood based on the true events, Dracula. According to the legend, the vampire, Countess would use money and power to kill the handmaidens and peasant girls with the help of evil soldiers. She killed the girls because she was haunted by ancient magic. She believed that the blood of young girls would make her immortal and always young and beautiful. She took the fresh blood of the girl she had just killed as quickly as possible, drinking a large glass of blood every day. She even bathed regularly with the girl's blood, which she believed would make her skin youthful. 
Indeed, she was known as the first beauty of Europe. She had charmed countless young gentlemen. When she was in her fifties, there were still young knights fighting to snatch her. It was also said that the more than 600 young girls were killed and all their bones piled up on the ground floor of a bathroom. After the Countess's death, her castle was haunted. So the Hungarian government sealed the castle to prevent people from coming near it. Lena finally understood that Dr. John was based on the events of the Vampire Countess and he used the mysterious substance extracted from the blood as medicine to delay aging. But she didn't know why its side effect was turning humans into vampires. She knew she could not escape this misfortune, so she tried to suck the blood of animals in a basement to survive. At first, because her body was very hungry, she felt very satisfied as soon as she sucked the blood of the animals. Those drops of blood were like a kind of elixir. It could make her body satisfied, even shaking with excitement. But once the sense of satisfaction passed, she felt she had truly become a complete demon. And gradually, the blood of the little animals could no longer satisfy her. The human blood seemed to constantly give off an aura of seduction, seducing her. Sometimes, she couldn't control her body anymore. The feeling of crazed bloodlust from within her body grew stronger and stronger. Many times, she approached her mother unconsciously, wanting to bite and drink blood, almost uncontrollably. At this point, she knew that she couldn't stay at home anymore, or she would harm her mother. The desire to drink human blood caused her a lot of pain every day in the struggle between will and body. But animal blood could no longer satisfy herself. She desperately needed human blood. So she went to the city. Thanks to being a high achieving medical student, she quickly found a job in a hospital. But her real purpose was to use her work to satisfy her desire to drink human blood. When people weren't paying attention, she would secretly go into the hospital's blood storage and steal the blood that the doctors prepared for the surgery. As she sucked human blood into her mouth, she felt such intense satisfaction that her whole body trembled again. But in the world, there was no secret action that was not exposed. After more than a year, her secret was suddenly discovered. While entering the warehouse to draw blood for surgery, a doctor accidentally saw a horrifying scene before his eyes. The doctor ran outside screaming in fear and also, she knew that her days of drinking blood were over. She was kicked out of the hospital and because of an internal announcement from the health system, she couldn't find work in this industry anywhere anymore. Walking on the busy street, she looked for blood everywhere. But she was a girl, unable to attack others to get blood. And she didn't dare to do it either. Just when she thought she would die like this, she suddenly found hope. She saw a child begging on the street which caused her to come up with a terrible and evil plan. She walked up to the child and left some money for the child. Her actions made a good impression on the child. She won the child's trust and quickly brought the child home with a warm and kind smile. She took the child to a health check, bathed the child herself at home and made nutritious food for him. But in the evening she gave the child sleeping pills. And while the child was fast asleep, she began to perform her behavior. She felt that she had truly become a demon, but she could not control her bloodlust. She used a knife to cut a line on the child's hand. This was the first time that blood had been directly drawn from a living person. This feeling was great for her, giving her an unprecedented sense of satisfaction, making her even more addicted to blood. Perhaps because of the pain, the sleeping child was startled awake. The child screamed when he saw Lena sucking his blood. The child was very strong. He pushed her to the ground and ran outside to find a way out. Lena knew that she couldn't let this child run away or her story might be exposed. So, she took a sharp knife and rushed towards the child and stabbed him in the stomach. The child fell to the ground in pain. He was almost dying. 
She was scared at first because she knew the consequences of murder anyway. But when she saw the blood slowly trickling out from under the child, her fear completely disappeared. In her eyes at that time, there were only pools of blood full of temptation. She stored and drank the child's blood for more than a month. During this time, every day she was very satisfied and excited. Fortunately, the child was a street child with no family, so no one cared about his disappearance. This case was never discovered. From then on, she often went looking for wandering children. She would also go to the orphanage to take the children for adoption, to force them to supply her with blood. So far, three boys had died in her hands. She also discovered that the blood of those teenagers could keep her young so that she still looked like her 20s despite being in her 40s, so she couldn't stop sucking blood. Whatever the reason, you must accept the severe punishment of the law if you commit murder, Captain Lee said. After modern vampire legend in 1995, another female vampire was also captured more than 20 years later. Suspect Lena sucked the blood of nine children of which six were blood slaves in her custody. The remaining three children were killed. Lena was sentenced to death in the first instance trial, executed that year. A boss, uh, did the vampire that existed 20 years ago mysteriously disappear like that? Uh, how can a vampire disappear for no reason? Thought Captain Lee. To catch him, Captain Lee's team at that time sacrificed two people, but in the end the case fell into a deadlock. Captain Lee said that he would tell Leo about the story when he had a chance, and now both needed to eat a full meal. Captain Lee and Inspector Leo got an urgent call from Captain Ben of the Southern Investigation Team on that day. Captain Ben had invited two of them to come to have a look at a strange case. I hope you will be interested in this unusual case. Captain Lee was curious as well, and he sat patiently observing the trial. No need to wait for long, the trial started when Judge's wooden hammer sounded. Before the case was judged, the prosecutor started to read the indictment. Han, a cargo vessel crew member, was accused of causing the accident of another crew member who had gone missing and drifted for more than a month in the Southeast Asian Sea. Han had an argument with his crewman at the time. Thus, Han was always looking for an occasion to get retribution. Han took advantage of the opponent being on the deck enjoying the night breeze to attack him from behind. Han promised himself that anyone who tried to insult him would be perished. The young man couldn't resist the sudden attack and his body lost equilibrium. The unfortunate young guy plunged into the sea, sunk under the swift flowing water and vanished afterwards. When Han saw the victim sunk to death, he thought the act would go unnoticed, so he chuckled gleefully. What Han did not expect was that the victim didn't die, but instead returned and accused him to the authorities. Han was subsequently apprehended. Han was perplexed after seeing the victim and felt he had seen a ghost, so he revealed the entire facts of the murder. The case had a clear investigation result, and the culprit also confessed. Thus, the punishment was given promptly by the court. Following the sound of the wooden hammer, Han was sentenced to 12 years in jail for attempting murder. After leaving the court, the three men found a place to smoke at the corner of the corridor, and Leo couldn't help but wonder how the victim could have survived in the sea for more than a month. Captain Han had heard that the young guy had been rescued by a merman. 
Captain Lee was taken aback when he heard this and wondered how such a weird event had happened. Captain Ben was in charge of the investigation. So, by the way, he summoned the other young plaintiff to tell Captain Lee the story. According to Captain Ben's introduction, this young man's name was Jindo. Claimed that he was saved by a merman. Captain Ben asked this young man, Jindo, to personally tell Captain Lee of his odd encounter. It was not a good idea to talk in here because it was in the courthouse. They offered choosing a quieter location. So they went to the tea house adjacent to the courthouse to hear the story. Jindo, the young guy, was concerned that people wouldn't believe him, so he didn't want to talk about it. However, when he noticed that Captain Lee was interested in this, he began narrating his weird story. He was saved by a man with fins, so he assumed that was a merman. Han tossed him off the vessel nearly two months ago. It was early fall and Jindo struggled to get up as soon as he fell into the sea. Jindo was taken aback since he couldn't believe Han had the audacity to sneak up on him because of a minor disagreement. At that time, he noticed Han standing on the deck and mockingly looked down at him, certain that he would perish in the midst of the water. Jindo was going to beg Han for help when a powerful flood of water surged in and knocked him down below. It came out that the rush of water left him unable to move his body owing to the pressure from the propeller behind the massive cargo vessel. When he emerged from the water again, he realized he had no chance of survival. The vessel had already moved hundreds of meters away at that point, and Jindo looked at it powerlessly. He realized he was in the middle of the ocean with nothing to hold on to. In such a sea, death was waiting for him. 100%. His stamina was nearing the limit after being in the water for more than an hour, and his body lost heat from being immersed in the seawater. At that moment, he was drifting at sea with just a sliver of a will to survive to support him. He felt as if countless water animals were nibbling at his flesh. But he couldn't fight any longer. He knew he could only watch himself becoming food for fish and shrimp in the water. Finally, due to weariness, his body began to fall to the bottom of the water. While immersed in the sea, Jindo felt like he saw someone was racing to help him. Then he couldn't remember anything and went fully into a dream. When he opened his eyes again, a huge bright sun was hanging over his head. Jindo protected his eyes from the burning light. At first he couldn't believe he was still alive, but suddenly the agony all over his body aroused him. He eventually realized he was still alive. Only then he did realize he was resting on a little bamboo raft with someone rowing in front of him. He glanced surprisingly at the man in front of him, but the man remained mute and continued rowing the raft. It was a strong built man. He dressed in clothing fashioned from the skin of some type of marine animal and had white hair. Jindo didn't dare to open his mouth to inquire, instead remaining mute and waiting. That was the first time Jindo realized how lovely the sunset on the sea was. That man, still peacefully rowing the raft, seemed to have mastered the location. The little bamboo raft abruptly altered direction and after a few paces, Jindo felt the water flow appear to change. Jindo had lived by the water from infancy. His father told him that there were many unusual currents in the ocean, and if you knew how to use them, the boat would sail with the current. But it wasn't something regular people could accomplish. That odd man seemed to know all about the unusual and tiny ocean currents that even sophisticated equipment couldn't detect. That wasn't everything. Jindo then felt that the strange man possessed even more odd and weird talents. The man abruptly came to a halt and muttered something in his lips. Then he dipped his hand into the water. Suddenly, he drew up a large fish and flung it in front of Jindo. 
Only then, Jinder realized the man was feeding him. Despite the fact that the fish was still alive, Jinder was hungry and couldn't refuse. Jindo gingerly grabbed the fish to eat, and when he watched the guy catch another fish, he nonchalantly ate it as well. He observed him tossing the remainder of the fish into the water, then prayed a few more times after eating the fish, and the sky, which was initially blue, suddenly gathered a few black clouds and began to rain. Surprisingly, rain fell around this bamboo raft area only. There were bowls made of coconut shells on the raft and the two drank some rainwater. Jindo was taken aback by what he witnessed. There would be waves and strong winds in the sea. Such waves were sometimes a few meters high, even a gigantic 10,000 ton ship must be afraid of. Not to mention such a little and basic bamboo raft. When Jindo saw the approaching storm, he held in fear but the guy stayed calm and bowed to the water. The waves appeared to be so powerful that it might sink this little raft at any time, but in the midst of the storm the little bamboo raft floated with the waves and after several tosses up and down, nothing occurred. That man seemed eerily calm, as though the waves couldn't possibly make things any difficult for him. Jindo felt as if he had died and then resurrected once the wave subsided. Jindo had been floating in the sea with that man for more than 10 days. Jindo attempted talking to the guy many times, but he ignored Jindo, turned his back on him, and Jindo couldn't see the man's face well. Jindo was taken aback when the man finally spoke out after more than 20 days. Jindo couldn't comprehend what he was saying, but the surroundings astounded him once again. Wait, is it the mainland? There were numerous lights in the distance, and Jindo could finally see the continent. The man was still sitting with his back to Jindo, but then he turned around and muttered something to Jindo. Jindo had never seen the man's face before. His face was unusual, with skin that resembles fish fin and sharp teeth. Jindo was terrified by the guy's look, and the raft shook violently at the time, leading Jindo to tumble into the water. The man then rowed away on the raft. Jindo stood still, unsure if the man was a deity or a ghost, but the guy who had saved him was clearly a decent person. Jindo departed and immediately dialed the police number. Even Captain Lee, much alone Leo, couldn't believe what Jindo had just told them. Captain Ben thoroughly examined and even confirmed Jindo wasn't lying. He investigated every ship that entered the harbor, but no one had seen Jindo. According to Jindo's description, he was most likely a merman, with skin like a fish's fin and sharp fangs. So in the end, Captain Lee, Captain Ben and Leo traveled to the fishing village where Jindo was brought ashore by the man to find out more about him. By evening, the three went to that tiny seaside fishing village. They decided to get information from the local fishermen. Captain Ben had contacted a local individual here in advance and this man could provide reliable information. Leo was intrigued by the fact that he was the owner of a seafood restaurant, so Leo was overjoyed to be able to have a whole supper of seafood. Captain Lee had to urge him to retain his police manners after seeing him ate too much of seafood. Captain Ben then presented the local old man who appeared to be pretty amusing. Captain Ben instantly inquired of the elderly gentleman about the other mysterious man. The elderly owner pulled out a match and lit a cigarette carefully. He then recounted the three of them the myth of the man known as the Sea Demigod. This occurred in a small fishing village by the Indian Ocean's coast. One day, a person was washed ashore. When he was found, everyone went to the beach to see. This individual was wearing a garment fashioned from the skin of unnamed marine species at the time. The young man appeared to be around 20 years old, quite muscular and robust, and he recovered fast in the next days after being saved. 
No one knew where he was from, and no one spoke his language, but because he didn't appear to be a bad guy, he was allowed to stay in the community. This man was incredibly strong and skilled at fishing methods. Everyone in the community adored him. He was highly familiar with the ocean currents and had outstanding sailing abilities. He was also learning the local language there by time. There was a girl named Yaba in the hamlet at the time and she regularly went with him to view the sea. The two developed affection for one another. As a result, the young guy from an unknown Southeast Asian nation arrived in this fishing hamlet and settled down here since then. But as the turbulent times came, the pirates began to riot along the coast. At first, they simply looted passing ships, but by time, they grew increasingly violent. One time, four pirates equipped with lethal weapons arrived on small boats at the small fishing hamlet. As soon as they reached the village, they began robbing money and food. The villagers did not dare to fight, fearing retaliation from the pirates, so they let them be. That was why these pirates got increasingly insane and gradually began to produce additional wicked notions. The pirate commander once asked to capture a girl in the hamlet who happened to be the sweetheart of the other young guy. The girl was reliant on her grandma who begged the pirates to let her go. The cruel pirate on the other hand chopped off the woman's head with a sword and smiled viciously at the girl. They kidnapped the girl and threatened that if they fought back, they would murder the entire town. The villagers were powerless in the face of their abuse, but the young guy having witnessed it could not be left alone. He approached the pirates using a fishing spear. The deadly band of pirates was used to being violent and never imagined that anybody would dare to stand up to them. The commander instantly directed his men to kill the young guy. Give that girl up and get out of here or you'll lose your life, said the young man. What are you talking about, big boy? Kill him for me? <laughs> the pirates carried out orders and were armed with dangerous weapons, but the young man was extraordinarily quick. He was the only one who fought with three pirates. They were all killed by the young man's spear after a few movements. The young guy confronted the pirate commander fearlessly, holding the spear in his hand. The villagers were shocked to learn that the young guy they knew possessed such a formidable martial skill at the time. The pirate commander was affected when he realized that all three of his men had been murdered, yet he continued to provoke. He stated he would give the young man a taste of misery since he thought he was simply a jerk. After saying so, the pirate leader dashed towards the young guy, holding a huge sword in his hand and cut the young man's shoulder with lightning speed. The spear in his hand, however, penetrated the commander's chest right through his body. The pirate commander fell and died on the spot, but the villagers were dissatisfied because he had rescued everyone instead. They began to fear that the true tragedy was just beginning because the pirates would return for vengeance. However, the young guy was perplexed as to why he had saved everyone while also making everyone fearful. Life must go on. So the young guy went fishing as usual in the following days. But the pirate's vengeance began the moment he set sail. The most ruthless local pirate captain has gathered over 40 pirates to this little fishing town and captured all of the residents. The locals had never witnessed anything so heinous and no one dared to speak up. The pirate was even more inhumane, detaining them one by one and questioning them about the young man, but no one said a word. The scenario changed when the ruthless pirate leader murdered an elderly woman. The villagers all stood aside and pushed the young man's sweetheart away. When the pirate commander realized she was the man's wife, he let out a wicked chuckle. That day, in front of the villagers, the girl was humiliated 
one by one by dozens of pirates. Finally, the enraged pirate savagely murdered the girl and her body was put on the shore with a huge wooden pole to warn the locals who planned to confront them. When the young guy came back from fishing and witnessed the scene, he went insane. Even more agonizing to learn that the girl was pregnant. That night, the entire fishing hamlet heard the young man's agonizing wail at the shore. A cry of outrage. Following that, the young guy carried her corpse up the mountain and dug a cemetery for her where she could observe the sea. The next day, people spotted him returning from the mountain, crossing the village road to the beach alone. But no one dared to go see him, because in one night, the young man's hair went white, his eyes lost their pupils, and his entire body took on a ferocious appearance. He was observed out the sea with a spear in his hand. Instead of his own fishing boat, he jumped onto the water on a basic raft. No one had ever seen him since that fateful day. However, more than 40 pirate bodies were eventually discovered on a tiny island. All perished as a result of a spear. Everyone assumed the young man was responsible for the pirates group's death. Since then, there had been several reports of fishermen becoming stranded at sea and being saved by a guy. His appearance was monstrous. Leo felt terrible for the young man after hearing the elderly man's story. However, because this was a tale, there were several variations that circulated. And because the elderly guy described Merfolk family at the time, it was assumed that the young man was the offspring of a sea deity and a human. Leo had heard of this mythology as well, but he had always envisioned demigods to be majestic and gorgeous. The old guy cut Leo off in his tracks when he stated that gorgeous demigods only exist in movies. The mythology of the merfolk was fascinating. In this universe, everything was possible according to Captain Lee. Many people thought that the man is still alive somewhere in this huge ocean. He will always be by the side of people in need, extending a helping hand when they are at their most defenseless state. It is said that the ocean is constantly full of secrets, which is never wrong.